The MMA Discussion Podcast is brought to you by SportsOfAnarchy.com. Visit our site for all your sporting news and needs. We're also brought to you by SubmissionFC.com. Enter the promo code SportsOfAnarchy10 for 10% off the best Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gear. We're also brought to you by the Flex Belt. Summer is approaching fast. If you want to strengthen and tone your abs, the Flex Belt, which is FDA cleared, might just be for you. Follow the link in the description below to get your very own. The MMA Discussion Podcast is now available to listen to on iTunes, the radio podcast app Stitcher, and SoundCloud, all of which are available for free on all smartphone devices. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 38th episode of the MMA Discussion Podcast. We are joined by a very special guest, current Invicta FC atomweight and strawweight fighter, uh, Lacey Shookman. How are you doing, Lacey? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Doing great. I'm very excited to have you on. Um, incredible performance you had last Friday at Invicta FC 12 um, against uh, Jenny Liao. In one of the night's premier highlights. I mean, uh, talk to us about that fight. I mean, what was that fight? Uh, what did that fight mean for you, and how exciting was it to get a finish? Um, well, you know, I went in. Um, I dropped two previous fights with Invicta, so I really had a lot to prove that I did belong there. Um, I knew Jenny Liu. Um, you know, she's known for her ground game. Um, so I knew obviously you're going to drill hard for that, but um, I knew she worked really hard on her striking game. That that's something that you know, maybe her weakness. Um, so we just worked really fundamental boxing, um, a lot of just fundamental Muay Thai, and um, you know that's what I feel is the key to the game plan um, and the key to the success on Friday, um, which is keeping it fundamental and just you know going out there to fight. You had competed for Invicta twice before. Um, not that your uh, competition wasn't uh, wet for wear. You took on Michelle, the Karate Hottie, Watterson, and uh, Yaka Hamasaki. Since then, you've actually done um, fairly well on your uh, in your time outside of Invicta, well, getting some wins as well. Um, you've with this win. What do you want to go for next? Do you want to continue fighting for Invicta? Also, by the way, my first question was actually going to be: This fight was contested at strawweight. You've generally fought at atom weight mostly. I mean, uh, is this a one-time deal, or do you plan on going back to straw weight? Is that where you're going to stay? Um, well, typically, like when I started my career, I started at straw weight. Um, that was kind of where uh, I wanted to be my career, but um, when I couldn't find fights and um, I needed to stay active, I walked, you know, well, I used to walk about like 135, so I started taking fights at 25 just to get fight. Um, and then when I saw that, the Adamway division wasn't very stacked. I decided that I wanted to drop 105, and so I did that for about three fights. But I'm, I'm really trying to re solidify myself at Strawweight. Um, it's where I feel, you know, strongest, happiest. Weight cut isn't horrible, but it's not easy. Um, so I, I definitely think that's where I want to solidify myself. Um, at least this year, I want to really focus on it. But I'm, you know, I just want to stay active and convicted. Can't get me on a card. You know, I, I am happy to fight elsewhere. Um, I just like to stay active and I don't like to support. Um, and I wanted to ask you also, I've had a hard time looking for myself. I know you're fighting right now outside of, in, in uh, Colorado. Where exactly are you training? Um, I train at the Shop Combat Sports and Fitness Center in House of Game Boxing. And that's in Denver, Colorado? Uh, yeah, Denver, Colorado. Awesome. Um, any um, fighters there that you that uh, any of the fight fans would know that you train with or your coach? Um, talk to us about your team. Um, you know, uh, at the shop, we're invite only, so um, it's very important to train with like-minded people, um, those that share your same goal, um, have your same dedication, um, so we're very particular who we train with, um, you know, it's not worth getting injured, you know, training with the, the jack-off that, you know, <laughs> has to do USC, you know, so yeah. um, we're pretty particular who we have there, but um, my husband, Ren Chicken, um, he's my head coach, uh, main training partner. Um, we also have a our one twenty five pro Jess Kissel. Um, he's coming up, but yeah, um, we're just you know very small. Um, our boxing gym we uh, have you know world champions like Rob Frankel, Manny Perez. Um, but yeah, uh, nothing, no one too notable. But keep your eye out for all of them. <laughs> nice. Um, with an, with you now fighting for Invicta, I mean uh, obviously that's probably where you would want to stay fighting. Uh, but with them. Um, the, the number of events that they have coming up. What do you? What are your future goals with the promotion uh, as a whole? Do you want to continue fighting strictly for Invicta? If you were to stay at strawweight, would you want to continue to impress there? And maybe someday move to the UFC. What are your actual goals thus far moving forward in your MMA career? Um, you know, I'm very patient, but obviously the long term goal. I've dedicated my life to this. I'm the best. I want to be world champion one day, whether that be at Invicta or UFC. 
you know, I'm not ruling anything out, but I'm very patient and I know I have a lot of work to get there. Um, but yeah, I want to, I just want to stay active with Ibiza. Um, just, you know, because that's what leads to the next step. And for, at the point I'm at, you know, I'm, I've been working very hard to improve. Um, I feel like my martial arts is growing leaps bound, but I, like I said, I'm patient. So I'm just, you know, I want to take some of the builder fights, you know, nothing, there's no easy fights in Ibiza. So, you know, anything that they give me is going to be a challenge and, It'll just help me get me to the next level. So, yeah, I'm definitely hooked. You know, eye on the prize, want the belt one day, but I am patient. And, you know, I'm not stupid. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, just because I, 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 just to clarify, which division is it that you, you're most comfortable fighting at? Straw weight or at? Um, definitely straw weight. I mean, they definitely have a fly weight snack. I just keep it, it's, you know, I can eat whatever I want. I don't have to really worry about the cut. Adam weight is just horrible. I mean, I'm very strong there, and the girls um, feel very small to me, but they are really fast, and the weight cut is really hard, so I feel like I find a happy medium at straw weight where, you know, I'm, I'm still as strong, if not stronger than most of those girls, and I'm a little bit faster, so, you know, I think it's a happy medium. Awesome, and uh, I actually have a few uh, fan questions for you, uh, for those that watch the event at Invicta, if that's okay to ask, yeah? One from Twitter from it's Alex uh, LC. He asked, "What an amazing performance! What do you uh, attribute your striking to?" And then he kind of just rambles on with hashtags. So I'm just gonna leave those alone. Um, you know, I, I would just say that you know he's constantly on me whether. We're actually physically working or, um, you know, sitting in bed, nothing sitting there, you know, going over what we worked on. Okay, so you see that this combo leads to this combo or see that, you know, you need this definition. He didn't hear. And that's all he knows. That's all he thinks about. So living with him, um, you know, I'm constantly being pushed to that next level. But um, our boxing coach, Steve Mestis, the same way. Um, he trains the kind of a heavyweight style, um, and then, you know, with Randall playing my game together, uh, you know, it just kind of leads to what, what it did, just real fundamental boxing and point high, and, um, you know, it just seems like that would fight. And uh, you cut off when you uh, uh, said your first coach's name. What's his name? Uh, Steve Mathis. Awesome. And then uh, second question. Um who do you, is there any particular opponent that you yourself wish to fight uh, in the near future in Invicta? Um, yeah, uh, uh, after the fight, they had asked me that, and I didn't want to be taken out of context. Um, I would like to challenge myself against Suzuki Inu. Um, I'm probably saying her name wrong. Um, but, you know, she um, is a real rounded She's really strong. She's very fast. Um, and, you know, she has great renown. Uh, she's well known, and I just have so much respect for Japanese fighters. There's just something about um, the Bushido and the, the martial arts lifestyle that I just respect so much. So, you know, I just think she um, presents a lot of things that bring out a lot of best in my game. So um, it would be an honor to against her. And uh, I, I'm sorry, again, you cut out. What, what was the name you said? Uh, Mizuki Inu. Oh, God. Oh, and she had a uh, good performance a couple events back, if I recall. Um, also from Sasha Shea. I mean, uh, and... Uh, Pretty simple question for any female athletes out there. Any uh, advice you'd like to give us who are starting out in MMA? Um, you know, find a team that's there to help you and not help themselves. Um, find a team that's, you know, um, very, uh, um, you know, it's, it's not about the hype. It's about becoming a better person for your training, becoming a better editor. Um, but just, yeah, find people that are there to support you and that are in it for you and that's a great answer. Um, and has there any been anywhere else other than Colorado where you've particularly trained uh, to to um, better your game overall, or have you just always stayed at where you're at? No, I've always stayed in the three o three. Um, I've been lucky enough that I've had a lot of coaches come through throughout the years. Um, we had our one of our original coaches was Rex Payne. Um, he's from Oregon. Um, he was a, a real vital part, um, leading us to the Brazilian world um, from our traditional uh, taekwondo and karate background so <clears throat> he was you know, a big integral part and then just now we have um, our professor um, black belt Joaquin Baca under Dean Lister 
Um, we also have our boxing coach, like I said, Steve Mestis, um, our kickboxing coach, World Combat League, and the people MMA, Master Donald Lee. Um, and then we also have our wrestling coach, Michael Rita. So um, we have a really awesome team of coaches, um, and we're just lucky enough that they come to us. Awesome. I wanted to ask you myself, too. It's like uh, you're still fairly young in the game, and uh, you started six years ago. I wanted to ask you, like, what got you into MMA? Like, how did you start? Um, well, me and my husband have been together since we were little, little kids. We've been best friends since I was like 12. Um, and he started in traditional taekwondo and he'd always come home and like want to practice his moves on me. And so like, after <laughs> I was like, I want to learn this from like that. So that was, that was kind of the beginning of the end. And, you know, I was always going to get suspended for beat. Like, <laughs> <Suspe> <laughs> like third grade. So <laughs> <laughs> it kind of was just a, a positive out. Like, um, martial arts and then uh, just through uh, the different coaches we had uh, eventually um, we started going tied with Trump, Trump and he kind of showed us the light of how to get into MMA so um, that was kind of the beginning and just for our book. Cool and uh, for, for you I mean you just uh, th you have a lot of um, submission victories. I wanted to know, is there any uh, grappling expertise training that you're also getting? Was Is that a, a favorite of yours to be able to take the fight to the ground? Obviously, your style has um, seemed to improve in the striking department. I just wanted to know, like, uh, what is it you favor in a fight? Where do you think you are the best in any MMA fight? Um, that's a tough one because I am a purple belt in jiu-jitsu, one strike purple belt. Um, and I used to hate wrestling, like, it just because it's so grind and every practice, everything just gets so hard, and you just, like, <laughs> oh, just break and grind the whole time. So um, I didn't really like that as much. But as my wrestling is improving, I'm, I really am starting to love the shooting and taking people down and being able to just control the position, you know. Um, but I would say in a fight, I love striking the best. That's, you know, I'm always going back to my roots. I love that. But somehow it's like an a instinct in my mind when we go to clinch, I'm like, get them to the ground and punch their face, you know, so, <laughs> I don't know, I don't really have a favorite spot, I'll just kind of go where the fight goes, but I do take to the ground a lot, just because, you know, you, it seems like you have a higher rate of finishing there, you know, and I'm always thinking, I need to finish, I need to finish, mm -hmm. I like to solidify wins, you know. Well, that's certainly what's made you, thus far, for many fans that I've talked to about you, the, a very exciting fighter to watch, um, and, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you about um, your weight cut. What do you do to prepare for that? Is there any kind of regimen that you have now, um, especially for straw weight, now that that will probably be your uh, your your ideal weight cut moving forward? Um, you know, just as soon as I get the call for the fight, I just start cleaning up my diet. You know, I, I am a glutton for ice cream. So as soon as I cut that out, that takes the health a lot. Um, but, yeah, you know, I just really clean up my diet, eat really deep. Um, Lots of vegetables, dark green, um, you know, up my water. I always drink a lot of water anyway, so I always drink food, okay? Um, but uh, then this time around, as I'm getting older, I'm starting to learn my body a little bit more. Um, I am starting to get more, um, like my muscles starting to get denser, things like that. So um, the water cut's actually getting a little bit better for me because my, my muscles hold a little bit more water, whereas before, you know, I was a little bit more, uh, I guess, fat ridden so now I don't have as much um, body fat to have to like break down first so yeah it's, it's getting much easier easier as I'm getting older actually um but I, I think I have it pretty dialed down just clean up my diet and then you know I just take like a salt bath day away that's awesome and um uh... With that being said, you, 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 as I said again, I've, I'm so fortunate to have you on. You had an amazing performance this past Friday. I can't wait to see you in there again. Um, any last things you want to say to any of your fans um, and Invicta if they're listening? Yeah, just thank you all. Um, it wouldn't be possible without all of the support of all the, the friends, family, and I call them supporters, not fans. I don't, I don't feel quite that great yet. <laughs> but I just appreciate all the people you know that. That helped me get there. Um, getting on this card was uh, had a lot to do with one of my sponsors, Love MMA. Um, you know, they they really the long drive on Twitter that I feel like really helped solidify my spot. Um, but yeah, just Invicta, please bring me back. You know, I want to keep getting people exciting performances, and I just want to keep showing people that I'm improving um, every day that I go to the gym. And thank you very much for the interview. I appreciate it. It was an honor to be on. Oh, well, the honor's mine. I'll tell you proudly, I'm a big fan. And uh, for anybody that hasn't seen her amazing performance, go to our MMA Discussion Facebook page.
go to our videos. Uh, the, her, the video of Lacey Shookman's finish is up there. It's a terrific finish. And uh, again, we can't wait to see you in there again. Lacey, thank you for coming on. Thank you very much. Hope you have a great day. Thank you. And that was Lacey Shookman, UFC Adam Way Glad to have her on. And we're just going to go ahead and shift gears real quick. We have another special guest. Made her U or her Invicta FC debut, professional debut. Sijara Sarge Eubanks, Invicta FC bantamweight. Glad to have you on. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing today? Great. Very excited to have you on. You had a very Thanks. terrific highlight reel performance in your in your professional debut, Invicta debut. What a way to come out. Um, talk, talk to us about that fight. How how important was that kind of performance for you to come out and make your professional debut on such a on such a huge high note? Man, it, it was it was fantastic all around. I've been uh, really anxious to get my pro debut out the way. I had fought in over a year um, after my last amateur fight, um, so I was really looking to get out there and I was really looking to make a statement with my first fight. And when I got picked up for the victim and make my pro debut, it was like it just could have been more perfect, could have been more exciting than that to make my debut on on such a large stage for women's MMA. Um, and so not only I make my debut, but I wanted to make it in a in a statement making fashion. So I want to come out and really show that. I'm a force to be wrestling uh, with in the Invicta Flyweight division, and I, I thought it was awesome. It was uh, awesome at the time. Certainly one of the premier highlights of the night. Um, you showed a very aggressive uh, style of ground and pound that we rarely see in MMA, but it was fantastic. One of my favorite performances of the night. Um, I wanted to ask you also, because uh, my co-host uh, is very interested in knowing this, where does the nickname Sarge come from? It's a very cool nickname, I think. And, uh, <laughs> love Nordica. Um, actually, yeah, a lot of people ask me the same thing. I kind of picked it up in college, obviously, because I was always just kind of like barking around with my friends. And I was always the one like trying to round everybody up and get everything together. And so we were just hanging out one day. One of my friends was like, all right, Sarge. And then it, it kind of just stuck. And then when I started training a little while after that, um, it sort of just went, went along nicely with my style and my martial arts style and my grappling aggression and my strength aggression. So it, it just kind of just stuck. It started with my friends in college, and it so happened to work out nicely. Now tell us about that. Like, how did how did how did you start? I mean, where does this your start in MMA start with? I mean, what's like uh basically tell us how you started getting into MMA. Um, well, I actually was um a lot of people don't know this, but I was actually like really overweight for most of my life, and so I was actually uh, I was working a desk job, and I was sitting around just getting getting bigger and just kind of unhappy and bored. And I had seen like um UFC on TV, I had seen like the Unleashed episodes and. I just thought, like, what these guys were doing were really incredible. So I was like, I wonder if I could try something like that just for fun and just to lose weight. And so I looked around, and I had heard uh, Lloyd Irvin Jiu Jitsu was the best on the East Coast and the best for MMA. So I went and checked him out one day, and I just walked in. Like, I hadn't, hadn't done any other martial arts or fighting. It was just like, hey, I think I want to fight. And um, I was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, yeah, well, like, why not? Let's see. And then everything kind of took off from there. I started with Jiu Jitsu. Um, and focused on that mostly for the beginning of my martial arts career and then quickly transitioned over to the MMA. And when was this? What year was this that you started uh, transitioning in MMA? Um, I started jujitsu under Master Boy in November 2008, and I had always kind of done a little bit of striking along the way, but I really didn't start training for MMA probably until um, like 2013, like just incorporating the all the striking and wrestling and cage work into my jiu-jitsu probably like 2000 late 2012 2013 and talk to us about your amateur career how many fights did you have from what i could only gather i was only able to find one amateur fight that you had um yeah i actually have three um but yeah it's hard to <laughs> most people don't see that one uh my first um was a wka a while ago um and then i fought twice in 2013 um and they were kind of back to back october um, is the one down in Georgia, I believe everyone found, and then I fought in Virginia in November of that same year, 2013. And and all, all three went went uh, finished with submission, so I was doing pretty good early on. Wow, nice. Uh, I know uh, the footage is is hard to find, but uh, that fight in November, I finished fourth round, rear naked choke. Uh, my first fight was a rear naked choke, and the one in Georgia, I finished with a Kimura. Yeah, very impressive. That was the one that I saw the the, the key lock submission. It was uh, very impressive. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, you train out a lawyer. Been talked to us about your time there thus far. And um, is that the only team that you plan on staying with? You plan on branching out to other gyms? 
Um, just talk to us about your overall atmosphere there at Lloyd Orleans. Um, I love it. It's been incredible. I started, like I said, November 2008. It's been nothing but um, uh, a wealth of knowledge of jujitsu and the arts and MMA and, and fight awareness and so many different things. I've had a wonderful time here under Master Lloyd and Team Woodman, and I have no plans whatsoever to train anywhere else. I got, <laughs> I got everything I need right here. Um, I started here. I put finish here. Um, I've gone white to black belt all under Master Lloyd Irvin. Um, and of course, you know, when you go travel, you go travel places, you always find another gym to train at when you're traveling. Um, but as long as I'm a professional fighter, all my camps will be done um, under Master Lloyd. And you're fighting at Bantamweight now. You made your debut. Do you want to get back in there quicker, sooner? You want to take some time to train? I mean, I know it's been a year. What are your plans moving forward? Um, yeah, go ahead. I would love to get in as soon as possible. I would love to get right back out there. I actually was supposed to make my debut at flyweight, but my opponent got injured like seven days out from the fight. So the replacement um, fight ended up happening at 135. So I was really kind of like, I want to make my flyweight debut because that's the division that I'm going to be fighting for in Invicta. So I'm actually hoping that they, they turn me right back around and get me out there healthy so feeling good. And I would like to take uh, my next fight at flyweight to let everybody know that that's my real weight class and I can, I can handle that weight just fine. Awesome. Is there any in, anybody in particular you, you're uh, eager to fight at flyweight um, at all? Um, obviously, I'm going for the top, so eventually um, I, I'd like to lead the path to, to fight for the belt. Um, but right now, I know it's still early, but whoever Shannon and my manager over at Sunday Crunch wants me to fight, um, that's all I'll fight. I got, I got no problems. Anybody they throw, I'll take. And um, talk to us about uh, your weight cut. I'm all, I know me and my co-hosts uh, are both always interested in understanding how fighters uh, cut weight. And uh, talk to us about how that weight cut went for you, especially being for a pro fight. Um, super smooth. I use uh, George Lockhart in Fitness VT. Um, I've been actually working with George um, for the entire time I've been at Team Murder for about five, six years. I've been working with George Lockhart. And he's the best in the game. I mean, he's made my weight cuts um, for the last six years smooth and easy. So getting down to 135 was a breeze for me. Um, I eat clean um, all throughout the camp, so I'm always staying healthy. So when you're healthy and drinking water, it's kind of easy to get get that weight off. Um, I, that's why I was looking forward to doing flyweight because I've never done a cut to flyweight before. But the the ease in which I got to 35, I really don't think another one's gonna be a problem for me, especially with the professional team on that helping me out. And uh, again, just to, uh, run back around to your uh, team. Anybody in per uh, particular you train with? Any training partners? Or co um, any other coaches that you do train with uh, to get ready for your fights? Oh yeah, we got a killer squad. Um, Master Lloyd's the head coach. We've got Troy Fox and their boxing coach. Um, he goes by hands with plans. He's one of uh, the DMV's best when it comes to boxing and. and and coaching for boxing. Uh, we've got Jamal Hargrove. Um, he's coming out from under Manu down in Georgia. He's doing our Muay Thai, getting our kicks all nice and tight. We've got Greg Howell on wrestling. Um, we've got George Lockhart on the nutrition. Um, we're, we're rock and roll. We've got a nice core of professional coaches who specialize in their, in their various different skill sets. Um, and my training partners, like my main training partner is actually Mike Easton. A uh, former UFC fighter, um, he he gives it, he, he kicks my butt every every sparring session. Uh, we've got a couple other guys, John Del Bruge, Pete Petis, uh, Sadiq Yusuf is a young guy coming up that's doing big things. We've got a nice floor uh, right now as far as as far as sparring. Are. I have no shortage of guys to beat me up at the gym right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that's that's awesome. It's good to hear though. Uh, talk to us about Invicta. How, how have they been treating you uh, thus far since you started? You've only gotten one fight, obviously, but uh, talk to us about that whole uh, experience going into the fight. How, were they, how, how was it all uh, for you? Invicta is taking really good care of me. Um, it was, it's like my first rodeo, so it's kind of like, um, like I didn't know what to do when I got to the airport. Is there a band? Is there like a guy on the side? Like, what? <laughs> 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 you, get, you get like this nice welcome fighters package with your schedule and everything in it. So I was totally leaving it up. It was my first time. And, and so they took real good care of us, made sure that uh, we stayed in a nice place. We got good food. We got everything we needed. Everything was an easy access. Like the weigh-ins were right there. The video was right there. Um, so Victor took real good care. It was, it was a good time. But I got these cool uh, big motor headphones. So it was <laughs> pretty nice. So I look forward to taking another ride um, for my next couple of fights here with Victor. <laughs> That's um, awesome. Um, 
I wanted to ask you also, you know, you uh, being a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, have you ever competed in any tournaments at all? Or? Oh, yeah. Um, when I was coming up through the ranks, I competed all over the world um, uh, at the lower belts. Uh, I've been the, I fought in Brazil at Baja Pajuca, I fought in Portugal, Cali, Worlds, uh, a multiple time Loki World Champion, like three times at Purple. Um, for the IBJJF, um, I've won trips out to Abu Dhabi. Uh, I've been on wow. the Jiu Jitsu. I haven't yet competed in the Gi in black belt yet, though. I completed Logi Worlds um, in October last year, but I'm really looking forward to competing in the Gi at black belt at Worlds coming up. Um, I've got permission to do that, so I'm really looking forward to to doing that. But I love competing in the Gi. Um, it gave me my competition foundation. Um, before I start getting to MMA, so it's definitely something I plan on continuing to do. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, I've I've uh I tried doing some research on you in preparation for this interview, and I and I didn't find any uh, videos or anything like that of you uh, grappling. But I would certainly love to uh, to watch that. I'm a huge fan of jujitsu and uh, and and uh, competition, and uh for sure you got to hook me up with a video of that. That'd be. In, uh, <laughs> oh, for sure, yeah, we'll, we'll get some emails. I'll send you some clips over. Um, in the in the jujitsu scene, I, I've definitely got some videos out there. Um, I've done pretty well coming up in the lower lower belts on, on my way up to black belt. So yeah, I'll, I'll keep up. I'll send you some good footage over. That'd be awesome. And uh, competing at the worlds, I mean, uh, will you be prepar uh, preparing for that just uh, as you would a normal uh, fight? Just being able to just obviously prepare strictly on your grappling, or would you take time away from MMA to do that? Um, like, what's the ideal way of tra preparing for a tournament? That, of that magnitude. Um, honestly, to prepare for a tournament of that magnitude at the at the highest levels of jujitsu, people are preparing all year for it. And before I was getting the MMA in preparation for the world, I would be training like like ten, eleven months getting ready for worlds and really kicking it up in the high gear in the last uh four to six months. So I'm actually coming in kind of on short training notice for the worlds. Um, so I probably just do a lot in the gi, just start working my systems and start working the transition stuff that I've been working all through the lower belts and sort of just um, uh, sort of knock the dust off per se <laughs> of the gi because I've been doing so much uh, MMA recently. Um, but being that I'm still in the victim fighter, I'll still be doing some MMA training as well. I'll just pick up the gi training pretty heavy for worlds, but I obviously got to keep my hands, my boxing, and my Muay Thai sharp in between the fights. So I'll still be doing that. Busy, busy. <laughs> yeah, <always. laughs> that's awesome though i certainly uh can't wait to see um these videos that you're gonna send me and also to uh to see how you would do there um for sure and so i actually have some fan questions from the uh some of the fans that actually attended the event that you uh uh performed at and um here's the first one being from a a james leno leno sounds canadian <laughs> sounds french uh james leno he asks, um, what, that was such an aggressive style. Where do you attribute uh, your aggression to in the cage? And uh, do you plan on ever um, not getting a finish? I <laughs> guess he's messing around there. But that is a good question. Where do you attribute that, that your, uh, your high pace style to? Then I don't know. It's just pure. I think it's the pure adrenaline. I think it's partly my personality. I think it's just, um, you, you know, you train hard, you work hard, you're like, you're, you're giving it all in the gym, you're training to your body hurts, you're training to your mind hurts, and when you finally have the opportunity to get in the cage and actually let all your skill sets come to fruition, I don't know, it just comes out, my style just comes out like total Donkey Kong. I just, like, <laughs> I just go nuts, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I've always had a, an aggressive style in jiu-jitsu coming up. I've always admired aggressive fighters. One of my favorite fighters of all time is Mike Tyson, um, Vandalay Silva. So I kind of always just love that style, that in your face, aggressive, like this is my time, my room, my my cage kind of style. I don't know. I don't know specifically. I'm just crazy, I guess. But yeah, <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> And we love it too. One last question actually um, comes from a uh, this uh, a Sasha. She asked, um, "What advice do you have for women coming up in the sport? And who are your favorite fighters growing up?" Um, good question. Um, for all the ladies coming up in the sport, um, it's tough. It's tough for ladies out there because we don't have the same depth. There's not as many women fighting um, as there are men. And so most women end up training with all guys. And so for a lot of ladies coming up, I would just advise that um, some women don't like it, but to really, really learn to train with, um, get a good squad of guys to train with. 
Um, Because it's hard to find an all-women's camp when you're coming up because we're so spread out right now. Um, It's good to get another lady to get in and spar with. Um, But but to have a good relationship with your team and the guys and make sure that even though uh, most guys are bigger and tougher, to make sure that they're still safe and and training hard. Um, And and to stay dedicated to the game, we need as many women as possible coming in. So um, keep keep training and and stay in the game. Um, As far as my favorite fighters coming up, uh, like I said, I already mentioned Mike Tyson and Daniel Lee, so uh, I will also say Muhammad Ali, just because he's a slip. Who doesn't? The doesn't greatest. Like Muhammad Ali coming up, right? Um, and I'll also say George St. Pierre. A lot of people, we actually have an in-team discussion about George St. Pierre. Um, a lot of people call him boring, but I feel like he's one of the one of the best tacticians um, as far as winning an MMA fight in the game. So GSP was a, one of my favorites. Good call. And uh, I love all those guys, especially Ali. Ali being one of my favorites. I came up in boxing, and that's one of my favorites of all time, for sure. And um, that's all the questions we got. And, uh, Sajara, i got to say, you've been a terrific interview, and uh, I'm excited to have you on. And I'm even more excited to see you get in there. You're one of the more exciting female fighters out there right now. And uh, can't wait to see you fight again. And uh, thank you again for coming on. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm here to put on a show, so hopefully everybody keeps watching it. I'm going to try to make this ride as exciting as possible. For yeah. Anyone. And with that, okay, also. Fight. Oh, yeah. And with that, also, you know, any last things you want to say to your fans uh, and Invicta if they're listening? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity, especially Shannon Nath and everybody over at Invicta. Not that many women get to make their pro debut here. So I'm super excited. They're hooking me up. Um, thank you to all the fans who have been supporting and watching so far. I keep watching because, uh, like I said, I'm going to make this fun to watch. I'm going to come in the finish and I'm going to come in to put on the show. And uh, I want to thank Team Lord Urban, Sucker Punch Entertainment, and uh, Fitness VT for, for making uh, this ride as uh, comfortable as possible. We appreciate you, you Banks. Have a great one. Can't wait to have you on here again for your next fight, yeah? Thank you, of course. All right. Great. Have a good one. And that was Sajara Eubanks. Glad to have her on. And now I'm finally joined by my co-host, Chris Pagman. How you doing, brother? Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm sorry I had to miss those two interviews. I wasn't feeling too good this morning, but uh, yeah, I'm ready to go. All right, and we're also joined by um, by our our, M- our MMA D favorite, Jonas. Jonas, my boy, how you doing? Hey, I'm good, man. Everything's on the up. Good to hear. We got we got a, a lot to talk about as far as one subject particularly pertains. As we talked about in our last episode, there was an alleged hit and run on the part of John Jones. Uh, uh, a lot has taken place since then. Monday, he uh, turned himself in, was out on $2,500 bail, uh, went to court the next day. Um, as far as that's concerned, it'll take now. It's now upon the uh, Albuquerque courts to um, make a decision in 60 days from that time to whether they want to take him to trial or not. Um, in which case, in 60 days, obviously UFC 187 will have passed, so he would have had the opportunity to compete on the card, which is what many expected might have happened. But after Dana White flew down to Albuquerque, sat down with John Jones uh, in a meeting with him and his lawyer, as well as Lorenzo Fertitta, um, that meeting took place. And uh, shortly after, incredibly, John Jones was stripped of the UFC light heavyweight title. It is vacant. And now Anthony Johnson will face Daniel Cormier for, uh, for the UFC, the vacant, not interim, the actual UFC light heavyweight title. And... Uh, <clears throat> And that's, that's that's a crazy turn of events. Not only that, John Jones has also been suspended indefinitely, probably until his uh, his uh, his ordeal with the courts is is over. Um, in which case, you know that makes sense. Uh, I mean, uh, if if I recall, Anthony Johnson also had a had a particular what if kind of case where you know uh, an ex an ex uh, girlfriend or wife of his was uh, accusing him of such things in which he was able to prove his innocence and his suspension was lifted. I'm sure the same deal will happen with Anthony, with John Jones. Uh, crazy turn of events, and uh, it's pretty wild. Jonas, what are your thoughts on this whole thing? I think, uh, well, there, there's a whole lot that really goes into uh, the whole turn of events. Uh, just with the incident itself, um, with this not being the first time that we've seen John Jones getting into trouble, um, particularly with accidents and substance abuse, uh, this this had to happen. Um, the UFC had to do this to protect its integrity, uh, however much integrity the 
fans want to think they have or not. It's it's strictly a business decision, and it's the right one. So I would say that uh, the suspension is warranted, the stripping of the belt is warranted, um, and you know I look forward. I still look forward to seeing Cormier and uh, Anthony Johnson go at it at one eighty seven. And Chris, what about you? What do you think of this whole ordeal? Yeah, I mean, I think it was the right move on the part of the UFC, but I was actually, like, I expected Jones to be suspended, but things seemed to be dying down at one point after Sunday, and I was a little bit surprised at the lens the UFC went to. They suspended him indefinitely, stripped him of the title, and I mean, I, I'm a little surprised just because I'm surprised they didn't wait to hear out the verdict because Jones still could have fought on the card, which is one. Two, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to get rid of a guy who's... Your big, one of your biggest draws and your champion when you don't really have to because you can claim that he's innocent until proven guilty and you can have him fight still, which I was a little bit surprised by, but I think they made the right move here. And yeah, like uh, Jonah said, I'm interested in seeing how uh, DC versus uh, AJ goes. That would be a really interesting fight. We'll definitely talk about that some more. Yeah, and uh, more more uh, more facts that come through. Also, he, he, uh, he was dropped by his Reebok sponsorship. And uh, he was also taken off of the pound for pound rankings, at least the UFCs. And of co- of course, certainly, you know, most uh, most fans will still have him up there at number one until he's defeated in the cage. <clears throat> you know what I mean? So, but um, as for now, um, they're basically not going to to acknowledge him uh, for right now, and the title is vacant. So as for now, it stands that J- Anthony Johnson is at the top at the light heavyweight division, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, I love this fight though, and uh, but as far as you know, I mean, we took we talked about it a lot earlier when it came to the uh, the uh, earlier this year the, the the cocaine drug tests, and uh, you heard how how um, how upset I was at how it seemed like they weren't going to do anything about it. It seemed like you know a twenty five dollar twenty five thousand dollar fine that was it at the time, and you know i i i felt like it was um unfair and unnecessary to really or i'm not unnecessary i guess unfair in that you know to to give a fighter just because of his status as champ or popular or whatever have you that you know s- certain fighters like that like jones who get caught up in doing these things don't get you know they get a lot more leeway and it took until a hit a, it took until after a dui after um, you know a, a cocaine drug test, that regardless of whether or not him taking that test should or should not have happened, he did test positive for it, and now a hit and run, and you know it's just so many you know things, and even personal issues. I mean, the thing the thing with the uh, it was funny because the, since the two ladies uh, and I, I've looked this up since um, that DUI case where he had two women in the back seat because of the fact that both of their alcohol levels were below the point eight. Um, um, limit, they were allowed to ask for anonymity, um, in the media, so we never found out who they were, or what, or what, or what that was ever about, <clears throat> but see, that's just even more things going on in his personal life, and it's just, it, it's just been a, 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 a slow car wreck in itself, pardon the pun, uh, in itself, since 2012, I mean, he just seems that like he keeps making mistake after mistake after mistake. Also, by the way, you know, he even got into a scuffle outside of the cage in with with Daniel Cormier. I mean, he's just had so many things going on um, that it's it's finally about time that finally something you know happens. Of course, you, like you said, they could have taken the route of not taking him off the car, keeping him on him, but at the same time. Um, it is the right business decision because I mean, how does it make them look to to have a, a possible convict a per, a possible future convicted felon? That's what he's facing. He's facing yeah. felony charges. You know what yeah. I mean? Because say he, yeah, because say he wins he wins that fight, and then he goes to jail for like three years right after. I mean, that's the possibility that they were facing right there, and I think that that also had a lot to tie in with their decision because. <clears throat> I mean, this is all alleged, allegedly, uh, as far and you know, hypothetical, and he is innocent until proven guilty. But it's obvious that, you know, it seems like there is a lot of evidence against him. The one thing that hasn't been cleared up thus far is they've uh, alleged as well that there was marijuana found in the car. Now, you know, um, I- I'm never one to be against guys who do marijuana, but you know, I mean, if 
if you're driving while well, really high, as well as like, uh, you know, he had a day. I'm, I mean, if um, if he was doing cocaine, it could have been out of his system, but it probably would probably be traces of it. But, you know, he was gone for a day. Certainly if he was on, uh, if he was high on marijuana, that would still be in his system if they took blood tests or anything like that. And I don't even know if that's what they did when, when he turned himself in. I don't know to any, I don't know what those details are. But um, but yeah, it just seems like it, it's what needed to happen. So uh, you know, I'm glad that it's happened. I am bummed out because, as everybody has known, I've been screaming left and right that I believe Johnson could have won that fight with Jones. And until it happens, people won't. If if Johnson beats DC, which I still I also believe can happen, we'll get into that in a minute. But um, you know, it is unfortunate, you know, because as I said as well when we talked about the cocaine uh, drug test incident, I, I want to see this guy get actual help. It can't just be, you know, a day in th a day in uh, drug rehab, and then you you convince a doctor, oh, he's fine. You know what I mean? Um, there, there's more to it than that at this point, obviously. And so, with that being yeah, said, Chris, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I've been in talks with uh, Mike, you know, the guy that was on our uh, one of our podcasts earlier uh, last month. Yeah. And you know, uh, we've been talking left and right about John Jones, but the big thing about you know the help that John Jones needs. I just personally think he needs uh, he needs a better support system, a better circle of friends. Um, too often we see professional athletes get caught up with people that kind of have, you know, the poor person's mentality and latch on to somebody with money. And so it kind of led John Jones to put himself in a situation where he's basically the provider and supplier of all things and all these poor-minded people want him to, you know, to take advantage of with him. And it's all fun and games, you know, when you're all having fun and doing it on, you know, John's tab. But at the same time, when when John gets in trouble, when these people are putting him in situations where John gets in trouble, they're nowhere to be found. You know, they're, they're, they're not there to, you know, help him out with that. So he needs to find people that actually have his best interests in mind, first of all. Yeah. Then... You know, you, you, yeah, you just need somebody that has his best interest in mind to just tell him that, you know, you, these things that you're doing aren't going to help you in the long run. You know, the, the drug use, the driving drunk, you know, all all that stuff. Those things aren't really helping him. They may make him look like he's, you know, a big star. And that, I mean, that, I guess that's the price of fame and all, but there's a bigger picture here. There's a bigger problem. Yeah, I'm actually more surprised about the level of action the UFC took in this situation because in the past, we've seen them be a bit more lenient with guys who are bigger names, and we've yes. seen them be stricter on guys like Matt Riddle who tested positive for weed a couple times and then gets basically released from the UFC at this point. So, And I'm also kind of tired of hearing, oh, John Jones is a young guy and people making excuses for him. Obviously, he has a problem. But saying he's a young guy, he's a 27-year-old man. He should know how to take responsibility for his actions, and he should know how to make the right decisions, especially with the level of uh, the way people look up to him and the level of success he's had. He's uh, one of the biggest athletes in the world probably at this point, and one of the, definitely one of the biggest, if not the biggest, in the sport. And he has to realize that, and he can't just be going around getting drunk, getting high, and just setting a poor example for people and breaking the law multiple times. Uh, aside from that, I think with the hit and run case, I think honestly he probably ran from the car because he might have been, I'm not sure if he was high, if he was drunk, whatever, but he might have been impaired and just ran from the car because he didn't want to get uh, caught on uh, driving while intoxicated and now he's based on a hit and run. Because when you hit someone, what you don't really like, what's the point of just running? There had to be something else behind it. You don't just hit someone and run. It's not illegal. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's an accident, but if you're inebriated, that makes it a bit more of a decision to run. Like, in my opinion, that's what this seems like it's going. And I'm sure when uh, Dana White and the UFC sat down with John and his lawyers, they came to the conclusion that, look, this guy's guilty. We don't want him in our uh, organization at this point. If he's proven innocent, I'm sure they'll bring him back, but it doesn't look like that's going to be the case in this one. Yeah, and uh, another possibility is that you know there there are legal reps um, that have come out and talked about the situation, and and with what facts that they do know, they know that a felony charge like this, if proven guilty, he could be facing up to three years in prison, which is whoa, you know what I mean? 
Um, yeah, but I think that's very unlikely that he actually goes to prison for that long. I'm, I could definitely see them being able to plead this down to a misdemeanor. How so? <laughs> oh, there's plenty of ways they could plead down to a misdemeanor. I mean, I'm not a they, legal savvy guy myself, so I was just that's why I'm asking because I don't know how they would do that. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, if uh, John, I was listening to Chelsea on the podcast. If John is able to reach out to the woman who is, or his lawyer is able to reach out and they take care of things, they take care of her medical bills, offer her support, and all that, they could just uh, the defense could be like, all right, basically she's not mad anymore. I'm sure she doesn't want to deal with this anymore. She's fine, and then they get, uh, John's lawyers can get it plead down to a misdemeanor, despite the fact that he has several uh, uh, prior DUI and the cocaine use and such. But um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that it'll get plead down to a misdemeanor most likely, and I'm sure that woman's. I mean, that's the guy you want to get in a car crash with because <laughs> so she, could him, she could sue him for that's a million dollar car crash again. Something I heard on Chael Sun's podcast, but <laughs> it's definitely. I mean, she could definitely make some money from the wreck she got into. That's a... That's how badly she was hurt. I mean, broken arm. I don't see a whole lot of... I don't see a major come up out of that, but hey. She should Mike Tyson that and be like, I broke my back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Can't work for the rest of my life. Ah. Yeah. No, I'm just playing. But it's, it's really just a really... It's it's what needed to happen. We all agree. And with that being said, you know we move forward. The show goes on. And uh, that being said, the the new main event of UFC 187, which still remains one of the premier cards of the year, uh, will now feature Anthony Johnson versus Daniel Cormier. And uh, as I've been saying since last year, I believe that Johnson was going to, no matter who it was against, he would fight for the belt this year and he would win. I feel a lot more confident now. <laughs> Um, and who he's fighting in Daniel Cormier. And now Daniel Cormier is, of course, not just, you know, some fighter. He's one of the best in the light heavyweight division in the UFC regard, uh, in total, you know. So I believe that uh, this would still be a tough fight, but I believe more advantages are thrown Anthony Johnson's way. And uh, so let's break this fight down. Uh, Chris, I actually want to hear what you think this fight, how you think this fight goes first. Yeah, um, actually, I'd probably be leaning towards AJ at this point. And, um, the good news is UFC 187 is still one of the best cards of the year. And despite the fact that Jones is on it, it doesn't really lose much of its integrity uh, just because he's out of the card. Um, I would definitely lean towards AJ for a few reasons. Um, for First of all, DC isn't able to mix things up as well as Jones is. He's not able to really employ the clinch as well and able to do things that Jones is. He's also a lot smaller of a guy in terms of height. So AJ can keep him on the end of his punches. AJ's a huge guy. He's what six three? Six, yeah, six two. Six yeah, two. He's, big, he's a really big guy. DC's like five ten. I know he's marked a little bit taller, but I think he's about five ten. Um, yeah. So I see uh, Rumble having an advantage. Jerry's also looked good against uh, the takedown, as we saw in the Phil Davis fight, especially. And he's been able to strike with guys like Gustafson. So. I don't see DC giving him a world of trouble on the feet. If they get him tight, DC might be able to land some punches. And he might be able to get uh, AJ down a couple times. I could see DC winning that fight if he's able to effectively use his wrestling, which he's one of the best wrestlers in the division, so it wouldn't surprise me if he is. But I would definitely favor AJ going into this one. Jonas. Yeah, I, uh, I think AJ's style kind of uh, trumps – DC's ability to wrestle at this point. Uh, AJ is very powerful. He's a whole lot stronger than uh, a lot of people give him credit for me. Um, and like Chris said, he will definitely be able to keep him on the end of his punches with his uh, height advantage going in. And, uh, you know, I, I think that Rumble's not afraid to, you know, to let the fight go anywhere. He's not afraid to let it go to the ground. He's not afraid to let it go to his cage. I'm uh, not afraid to have this fun award, so uh, I, I think Rumble is as tough as they come for a guy like uh, DC, and uh, I think AJ gets a win. Uh, probably a late stoppage or a uh, unanimous, unanimous decision. 
Yeah, I just wanted to add in that I, I also think that uh, AJ's power makes things a little bit more difficult for DC in terms of his wrestling. Because if you're shooting in on a guy like that and you get caught, it's a bit different than when you're shooting on a guy like John Jones and you get caught. Jones is a powerful guy, but he's more powerful in like a different way than AJ is. AJ has that one punch knockout power where Jones has like a lot of his knockout finishes that come by like spinning. He has a spinning elbow knockout. He has a lot of ground and pound TKOs. He hasn't ever really been that one punch knockout guy, so it it will be a little bit different for DC in this one. Am I next? Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's my breakdown. I uh, John Johnson had had some things going against him and for him in the striking department when it came to fighting Jones. First of all, he didn't have the reach advantage. Um, he was going to be dealing with somebody who could throw uh, many different kinds of strikes, such as leg kicks, body kicks, head kicks, spinning kicks, uh, elbows. Um, he was going to be got, uh, coming against a guy who had a much more wider arsenal than what DC has. From what I've seen, DC only throws, you know, your basic kinds of kicks and, uh, and, and uh, you know, um, basic punches, you know, overhands, uppercuts, uh, body punches, you know, and that's a, that's a good arsenal that DC has. Um, I will say this, DC also probably has more power than Jones, so that's another thing that Johnson will have to deal with as well as, uh, you know, for DC, he's going to have to deal with another guy who also still has the reach on him, but not even, but not even just that. At the end of those punches, he's going to feel those. He's going to get marked up by those. He could even get cut by some of those. And um, for Johnson, <clears throat> he will actually now have the, the reach advantage, as I said, and uh, we'll, we'll be able to, you know, not have to fight as aggressively, but just have to fight more tactically. Because to uh, for what what I thought that he would need to do with jo with Jones is he would need to be fast, and he is fast. I still believe he's probably I, I would certainly believe he's faster than um, than Daniel Cormier on the feet. His footwork's faster. He's much more aggressive. He's a guy that likes to come forward, um, but he can do it tactfully in this fight with have, while having the advantage because he certainly doesn't want to get too close and get and and uh, risk getting taken down. He's going to want to keep uh, DC at the end of his punches and kicks, and I'm sure that utilizing kicks high, either to the body or to the head, uh, to use them toward to the legs, like I thought he should with Jones, would probably be be ill advised because DC could catch those and get a takedown. Jones was not known for uh, being too well uh, well equipped with that kind of uh, arsenal, being able to catch kicks low and and take a guy down. <clears throat> but um, and DC is he he's certainly done that before. So um, I, I would certainly uh, suggest not kicking the legs in this fight, particularly with DC, and being able to actually land more so to the body and to the head with his kicks and staying on the outside, being technical, being sh but also being fast and strong. And he just gotta he's just gotta still be on par uh, and uh, with uh, with his speed and strength advantage and just basically do what he's done in the last four fights, essentially with his striking. So um, in that department, I believe that he'll be able to get DC probably in round two, in my opinion. I think that he'll be able to fight those takedowns. He'll fight smart. He's, he's, he's fight, he fights smarter than he's ever fought before. His IQ has drastically improved in there um, in, the, in the last recent years. So you know, I, I see uh, DC trying to get takedowns, not getting them. He'll probably charge Anthony himself, in which uh, Johnson will probably be uh, already well equipped to get to get away from the cage. He should have already been training for that for uh, the Jones fight, um, in which you know just got to stay off that cage. He just stays off that cage, stays away uh, from the takedowns, and keep this a, a distant and technical fight. Uh, as well as utilizing the power and speed and footwork that he already possesses, uh, this seems like it's a. Uh, it seems like the work's already in there for Johnson. And I think he's going to get it done in round two. Knockout. So AJ's nickname is Rumble. Is your nickname Rumble? <laughs> 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 you silly bitch. <laughs> wow. Calling me out. All right. All right. That'll come back to bite you in the ass. Watch that. That will certainly come back to bite you in the ass. I at least broke it down. Rambling. Rambling. Right. It's not bad rambling. It was good rambling. I. I <laughs> Sorry. Right. That to you. But uh, definitely the point you made about um staying off the cage is definitely one AJS to keep in mind.
Yeah, I mean, there are certainly many ways DC can win. I just believe that Johnson having to be equipped as he was. I mean, we're not we're what I'm barely a month away from the fight, less than that at this less point. Than a month, yeah. yeah, so I, I would assume by now he's he's certainly got his wrestling defense in, and certainly it's also something moving forward till the fight he's got to keep working on. You know, so. Oh yeah, I'm sure he's definitely well prepared going into a title fight. And we have to also keep in mind, DC was preparing for a three-round fight and in the, for a later date. So No, actually, his fight with Ryan Bader would have been five oh, rounds. Oh, yeah, it was the main event, wasn't it? For, yeah. Uh, fight night, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. it is coming up. It is coming up an exact month prior. So, I mean, this preparation time. Uh, <clears throat> I might throw him off a little bit, but I forgot that it was a five-round fight, so it shouldn't affect him as much. No, I don't think, especially coming off a five-round fight with Jones, I'm sure that, that uh, that'll that stick with him. And, and, you know, I mean, that is a possible weakness that DC may want to exploit because uh, we haven't seen Johnson ever enter championship rounds before. And so, I don't That's know. true, too, yeah. And do we also have to factor in how just how strong DC is? We talked about uh, Rumble strength. DC is a powerhouse. That's no lie. <laughs> Certainly, you know, I just believe that, uh, you know, if uh, when it comes to hand speed and footwork, Johnson moves faster than most guys in that division, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I can't even think of somebody that moves faster than him in that division specifically. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's very explosive. He has a fast twitch muscle. Yeah, exactly. Jonas, any yeah, last? I mean, oh, AJ ahead. might look like the stronger guy, but I wouldn't count DC out of being the stronger guy in there. I believe in the clinch he's the stronger guy. He knows how to work the body and the momentum, uh, you know, like a pure wrestler does. And this is a different wrestler. DC is not the kind of wrestler Jones is. Jones, uh, when it comes to, to, you know, single or double leg kinds of takedowns, he's not on DC's level. That's another thing. That's where DC shines. Jones is good at getting uh, throws and, and leg and leg tosses and getting guys off the cage, especially off the cage. As I said, a, a very – uh, a very fun statistical fact for Jones is that over 70% of his takedowns come off the cage. Yeah, that's, <clears> odd. that's very odd to me. Not really. It's because he utilizes his size so well and he utilizes... Oh, no, he does it very well, but a lot of guys have trouble now because the way MMA's been evolving, takedown, getting takedowns off the cage has been really hard. Guys are able to use that cage to keep themselves upright and it gives them time to get underneath the hands and widen their base. Yeah, but him having the long reach that he has, always oh, being able to reach long, around, yeah. and uh, yeah, not 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 only that, but also being as tall as he is, having the leg uh, leg reach advantage that he also has, he's used to just throwing guys off of their uh, off of their core and their balance, and just easily is able to find that. And then once once they're once even for a split second, somebody's off their balance, he's able to dive on those hips. If uh, and even he doesn't even need to do that at times, he can just go for leg trips after that. And yeah, he gets, if you watch a lot of his fights and a lot of his takedowns. Um, that's that's how it gets it done. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't saying it was. I might have misworded it or something like that. Saying it's weird to see that. I think it's just something unique to John Jones and very few other guys because most takedowns are a little bit easier to get in open space. Yeah, and DC is one of those guys that is is certainly uh you know well equipped to being able to get on on a guy like Johnson. And that's why you know he's got a. He's got to fight this smart. He's got to be on the outside. I mean, when it came to Jones, I knew that if if Johnson was going to get into the clinch with Jones, um, he'd have to be uh, equipped to you know strike him in the clinch and be able to exit out. Because John, I knew John would would assuredly try to clinch and get a throw from there, or at least push Johnson to the cage and and work a takedown from there. <clears throat> so I believe that Johnson will be um, ready to fight in the clinch, but. Now he'll be fighting a guy six inches shorter. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, I mean, that's certainly something he's got to work on moving forward because a guy like uh, DC who can really, you know, power on those hips from the clinch really well. I mean, he couldn't against Jones, and Jones defended beautifully, and so that's just another thing Johnson needs to work on. If he defends those takedowns and DC can't get this to the ground, it's going to be a long night for him or a short one. Most likely. And um, we also have to remember from the clinch, DC is one of those guys who just likes to scoop you up and slam you on your ass. Yeah, definitely. Gotta watch out for that too. Yeah, definitely. I don't. Uh, I would. I would say this. I believe by fight day, Johnson will be one of the heavier guys he's tried picking up and lifting. <laughs> I don't think you'll have a problem with that. No, I don't think you'll have a problem with it. I'm just thinking. I'm just saying that you know, um, Johnson could certainly use his weight to his advantage as well. You remember, know? he fought at he fought some big guys at heavier. Oh, heavier definitely. Heavier. But he wasn't like slamming those guys like he did to Hendo or. Um, I mean, he you know. slammed some of them. Certainly, I mean, uh, the Josh Barnett one was the best example. <clears throat> I, 
I mean, the Hendo slam is probably his signature, you know, but... Oh, he that half a F5 there. thing that he threw it was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, DC's a slammer. And, uh, if... if I think Rumble could handle that, though. I do, too. Yeah, he's, he's a tough guy. This is just such a great fight still, no matter what. I mean, it's still, there's no lack of excitement here with this new main event, uh, for sure. And uh, even even with even with it, the fact that it's a uh, that it's for the vacant title, we're gonna get a new champion that Saturday. You know what I mean? And uh, it's gonna be exciting yeah. to see um, what direction the division takes until John Jones returns. You know what I mean? Kind of like with uh, welterweight, how it was unknown, GSP gone, what's gonna happen? It got exciting. Um, and that division looks great, great now. I mean, light heavyweight uh, is, is still short of many contenders following this fight. So uh, we'll see what happens moving forward. But, you know, it, it could be a good sign of things to come or not. But uh, hopefully it's the first. We'll see. Yeah, I think another point we can actually bring up, I, I just thought of this, is that uh, who's going to be taking DC spot in that fight with Ryan Bader? Well, the, the, this, is, this was discussed on UFC tonight. This is what they want to do. I don't know if they will. They say that they might give uh, um, Bader over and have him fight Gustafsson on that Germany card, and then they'll move Glover Teixeira to the uh, the the New Orleans card and have OSP fight him in the main event. That was a discussion, and it's a rumor thus far. It's not. It's not been made. That was just talked about by uh, Arrow Hawani, Kenny Florian, and uh, Michael Bisping. That's a possibility, but it seems like it's a little much in terms of switching guys around, don't you think? I agree. You know, I mean, uh, but I mean, OSP is certainly a guy that I, I would I would want to throw in there. He certainly pitched his name back into that hat with that with that spectacular knockout of Patrick Cummins uh, a few weeks back. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, but uh, yeah, obviously the problem with that would be is him Bader fought very recently. So yeah, see, but that's that's the reason that's why. Which, yeah. Yeah, that's the I reason why they would saying. want because they wouldn't want to throw Glover over to Bader because they've also fought before. That's why yeah. they want to keep Alexander in Germany because he's a European draw. Keep him there, throw Bader over to Gustafsson, and then Glover fights OSP. So everybody has a new fight. It's no, there's no rematches. That's so I see the purpose of why they were throwing the names yeah, around definitely. and switching them like that. I just um, think it's uh, I, you have to get everyone to agree to that, which would be a, maybe a little tough. I think for the most part they probably would. But, um, yeah, there's no one really else to throw in there with Bader at this point unless you just throw in someone else. I can't really think of who you would throw in there at this point. Well, I mean, I, I, any of those names work for Bader. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure he's – I mean, uh, I, I'm sure he would like a rematch with Glover. But if he did get a, a fight with uh, Gustafson, say he beats Gustafson, he's certainly next in line. That's five straight and then he's beating oh, two yeah. contenders. I think the Gustafson fight would make the most sense at this point in terms for uh, Bader. But aside from that, I can't think of anyone to throw in there just in case they aren't able to get that whole thing done. Yeah. I actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it makes sense to me. Of course, there is a lot of uh, working around that that they got to do. There's These fights have been signed, so it's, it's just a matter of getting all these guys to agree with. But, you know, um, <clears throat> when is that Germany card? I kind of need to know that. Um, let me check. Look. Yeah, look it up for me. Jonas, what do you think of those fights? I think um, I think with Jones being out, those all become necessary, to be honest. And uh, I don't think that there's – I look forward to both of those. Uh, that will tell a whole lot about who's next uh, going forward. Yeah, I feel I, – I, I, I like the fights. I mean, there's no rematches. They're all new fights. They all really help to signify who's coming up, who might be next for the winner of DC and J Johnson. You know what I mean? Yeah, the Germany card is on – Saturday, June twentieth, and the card that uh, DC was supposed to fight Bader on is on the sixth. So it's only a two week turnaround. So I think that makes things a little bit easier there. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to look. What date was the uh, Germany card you said? June twentieth. June twentieth. And then the so same. I mean, fourteen days. They should be able to get those guys to agree. Or could you see anyone maybe uh moving up or down to take that fight with uh Bader at this point? Like from the division? Yeah, I mean, that's always an interesting possibility. I don't think, I think it's a rare one. I think, I don't, I don't think it's very likely to happen, but it's if, always a possibility you have to take into account. Yeah, I mean, if that were to be the case, I think they would ask Bader to move up. Um, 
I don't think any heavyweight would just say, yeah, I'll drop down to 205. Uh, I mean, Jackson's always a name you can throw in the box, but he's still got his legal stuff to, to deal with. Yeah. So, I mean, for now, until problem. until we know more about that, then, yeah, we won't want to comment. Do you think there are any middleweights who may want to take, like, since they're taking the fight on short notice, might want to fight at 205? Mm. I don't know, I mean, I man. can't see anyone in the top 15 at this point. Cause, I, I guess mean, Machida. I mean, he's kind of he's kind of losing his 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 thunder at light or at middleweight right now. So yeah, I was thinking Machida, honestly. Machida that's, could come back up. That's the only one I can think of, to be real. Yeah, I wonder if he'd want to fight on two months' notice, though, just to get in there that quick again. I'm not sure if he would. I don't think uh, ladies would do it just because. He's in the top ten right now. He's on a good streak, and I don't think he would want to ruin that. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a lot that they got to figure out. I mean, so if they go with that option of you know switching the, all those four fighters around, I'd be I would be okay with it. Plus, it, it yeah, more so the the most option. exciting the most exciting thing about it would be if Bader beat Gustafson or if OSP goes in there and beats Glover and then becomes a a, a big a, a big name and in, in the contendership hat. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think at this point that's probably the best situation for them, for everyone involved, actually. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it may not be the best for uh, Glover because he winds up not fighting the number two guy, but for everyone else involved, it worked out pretty well. Yeah, and actually, we got to get into this discussion real quick. There's a uh, did any of you guys see the um the first uh, season of, or the first episode of the Ultimate Fighter, the new? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I watched it. Yeah. I thought the, the the fight was decent. Um, I like the new concept. There's so many more rules now. It's uh, it's a lot to keep up with, though. <clears throat> um, but I I like how they're taking it. It's it certainly seems like a new concept. And then the winner of the entire tournament itself could pro- uh, probably lands a contract. But it seems like they're not really emphasizing that. Like you know, um, it's more about the team, which I get I get is the gist. You know, team versus team here. You know, this gym versus this gym. But uh, it seems like they're they're shying away from guaranteeing any fighter that actually wins the tournament gets a contract. I haven't heard anywhere that the, that the winner gets a contract. Have you? Um, I'm not sure if I heard that, but I'm sure the winner gets a contract. That wouldn't make sense if he didn't. I'm sure they'll give guys who impress on the show a contract, which mm-hmm. is something they've always done. I don't think they would just make the show and not give guys contracts because it makes no sense at that point. Why would they yeah. just give her away money with no real return aside from TV ratings? Doesn't really add up. But um, yeah, I mean the first fight I was it was good. it was an okay fight. At the end, I got pretty excited when um, Michael Graves was able to take uh, Kamu's back. Kamal, yeah. I'm yeah. not sure what exactly his name is. I forget. But um, yeah, it was an, it was an okay fight. There are a lot of different rules, and obviously the teammates aren't <laughs> fighting each other, and they're only fighting each other. The Black Aliens are only fighting American top team guys. They can lose and still fight, so it's a lot different than every other Ultimate Fighter we've had. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a welcome change just to mix things up a little bit, see how it does, and maybe they keep it around, something similar to this around, or they work with the idea, or maybe they just go back to the old style. I'm not sure exactly what they'll do, but um, I'm just interested to see how it plays out, how everything goes. By the way, the UFC just announced UFC 192 will be taking uh, place at the Toyota Center in Houston, Texas. Just a quick note. <clears throat> and uh, jo- Jonas, did you watch the uh, <clears throat> the Ultimate Fighter? And what did you think? I know you're one of the tougher sells for that show. Yeah, I, I totally missed that. You know, personal stuff is getting in the way. So yeah. Oh, I watched really, it. Yeah. All right, you gotta watch it, dude. Oh. <laughs> Uh, back to the UFC, you just said 192s in Texas? Yes. Yeah, Houston. Didn't they, didn't they put Johnny Hendricks on there? Uh, I don't I don't see it having any fight on it. That would make sense. I mean, you, you, it it's always makes sense to put Hendricks in Texas. Um, uh, but I don't see any fight for Hendricks. Do you? Look him up. See if you've seen him. Uh, no, he's not, he doesn't have a fight booked yet. I'm just saying, do you think they would put him on there? Oh, yeah, I'm sure it would make sense. Against who? I don't know. Who would you want to see him fight? When is that? When's uh? It's October third. I would think he. Yeah, I would think he'd want to fight prior um, to that. The, isn't a fight between uh Condit and Alves coming up? Or maybe the winner of that. Yeah, that's in. Yeah, that's in the first. Condit. He already beat Condit, so I, I don't know if they would do a rematch between them. But if Alves were to win that, they could do that. 
I, I, I can see. I've seen quite a few fans call for a Condit Hendricks rematch, especially for it to be five rounds. Oh, if it was five rounds, I'd definitely I'd be in on that fight, but I don't know if it'd be a Yeah, this is a pay-per-view, pay-per-view, so. Yeah, it's a little bit tougher to do that, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, Condit versus uh, Hendricks, too, would definitely be an interesting five-rounder or maybe a Fox, uh, Fox fight. Yeah, I mean, or say this, you know, say, uh, say Robbie beats... Uh, Law or McDonald, and then they want to do that trilogy fight in Texas. That can make sense. Yeah, I don't know if they jump straight to that, but uh, yeah, I don't know that either. I, I certainly didn't think that right after the Matt Brown win, he should go straight to a title shot. Um, I would like to see him fight one more time. If he could fit one more fight in there prior to that event, then uh, you know he'd uh, have. Woodley set to come back. I don't know. When I know did he Woodley last fight. He lost. He last six. beat. He last beat uh, uh, Gastelum. Yeah, and he said he's ranked number three right now, and he said he wanted the fight with Hendricks. I just don't oh, yeah, I, I was also calling for that fight. That should be the fight that comes up next. Definitely. If he can come back in time for Hendricks, it would be a great fight to see. Yeah, maybe put that fight on this card if uh, Hendricks isn't back by then. I don't know if either guy is injured. But... No, uh, Woodley's injured. Woodley's injured? Yeah, he broke his foot in the Gastelum fight. I don't remember that. Yeah, he's been yeah. on crutches. Oh, shit. Well, then it's, uh, it's uh, I guess it's up to Hendricks and his prerogative. I don't know what he wants to do. Um, but that, that fight is certainly one that I want to see. Um, looking at uh, Tyron Woodley's record, it's actually pretty funny. He has five knockouts, five submissions, and five decisions. <laughs> um, trying to think of any other Welsh weight contenders he could fight. I mean, Dung Young Kim, could he, uh, if he beats Josh Berkman, is, is an option. Uh, anybody else? No, I can't think of anybody else. Honestly, he's beaten quite a few of those guys in the top ten at this point. Let me look at the top ten. Yeah, no, I don't think we have to get too off topic on this. Basically, this is all just speculation. Yeah, I know. Um, also, by the way, this Saturday marks the uh, the historic event of UFC, or UFC, haha, <laughs> boxing, Floyd Mayweather taking on Manny uh, Pac-Man Pacquiao. Now, um, Jonas, I know you're, uh, who you're going for. Chris, who do you have in that, that boxing fight? All right, who do I have or who am I going for? Those are two different Well, players. yeah, I figured that they would. Who, who do you think wins? I think Mayweather wins. I'd rather see Pacquiao win just because I don't like Floyd Mayweather. I mean, I as a boxer, he's fantastic defensively, and he's a fantastic counter-striker, but... um. Pacquiao, I would, I would like to see him win that fight, but I think his style plays into Floyd's style. If he's too aggressive like Pacquiao, we've seen in the past be very aggressive, and it's caused him to get knocked out in that Marquez fight. And it's, I mean, aside from that, we haven't seen Pacquiao look bad in many fights. I mean, that Bradley loss was a, I mean, that was just a horrible decision. He wound up avenging that fight, winning the next one pretty easily. But um, yeah, I think. That Floyd uses his defensive style very well. I think Pacquiao, as we've seen in the past, is an aggressive fighter. He throws a lot of hooks. He throws a lot of uppercuts. And Floyd's very good at getting out of the way and returning. So I definitely think we see Floyd win another decision. But if Pacquiao's able to employ a different strategy, maybe not be as aggressive, just stay planted a little bit. Obviously, use movement, but stay planted and not charge forward and kind of make Floyd come to him a little bit, he could win. It's possible, but I definitely see Floyd coming out with a decision. I think a good strategy for him is to really open up each minute of each round, very aggressive, try to get some punches in there, not get hit too much, attack, and then stay mobile in the center. So that way he's able to make Floyd come to him. He's uh, able to keep him on the outside of his punch uh, of his punches. Obviously the reach would probably go to Floyd, so he's going to have to uh, – um, keep his distance, but at the same time explode in and charge and not and keep him against the ropes, against the uh, corners, and uh, and really make sure that he's always taking charge of the center and making sure Floyd has to come to him. You're right, that is a decent strategy to have. Um, and, and and in that case, he'd be able to uh, hang on to the uh, to the rounds, win the more of the rounds, and then could easily uh, with that not easily, but uh, with that strategy, I think that it's very possible he could win that fight. Um, but yeah, Floyd is one of the greatest boxers ever to lace him for sure. And so, uh, you know, even with that, I'm sure Floyd would find a way to adapt and and, uh, and possibly find the win. Um, Jonas, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, 
To me, the only way this fight even matters is if Batman wins. Um, <laughs> yeah, if, if Floyd wins, it's kind of a, yeah, well, you know, Pac-Man got knocked out by Marquez. Uh, even considering the robbery of uh, the Bradley decision in their first fight, uh, and that all kind of made the whole fight lose its luster altogether. And this is a fight that should have been booked six years ago. So, I mean, it, it, it's huge, but it's still not as big as it could have been. So, I mean, that's why this fight, to me, just doesn't matter. Unless Pacquiao wins and becomes that one in the L column for Floyd Mayweather. So, I mean, I'll yeah. watch it. I'll enjoy it. But, you know, I, I think Floyd ends up winning again like he usually, like he always has. And uh, it'll be a well-so-what moment for me. Yeah, I see what you're saying there, Jonas. I think that... uh if Pacquiao wins or if it's something controversial happens, I think that would be the only way that it winds up mattering. This fight, of course, it should have been made years ago. And I think if it was made years ago, a lot of people might see it, Pacquiao winning this one because a lot of people were saying Pacquiao would be the guy yep. to beat me, brother. There were. It sure were until uh, Pacquiao started looking really human. Yeah. And that's really all there was to it. I mean, this is still one of the biggest, if not the biggest fight in boxing, because it's going to sell. Regardless of anything, oh, yeah. it's going to sell yeah. like hotcakes. <laughs> For cake. sure. No question. Man, so much going on in the last three days as far as with the uh, the light heavyweight title picture. And uh, now we've gone over that fight and uh, the possible other options next after this fight as far as light heavyweight uh, contenders go. And... Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they go that route. We'll see what happens. I'm sure the, the UFC is working on it right now. And, uh, yeah, this weekend, uh, enjoy the fight, the boxing fight, Floyd Mayweather versus Manny Pac-Man Pacquiao. Um, and uh, with that, I think we're good. Anything else you guys want to bring up? No, I think I'm good. Jonas. Yeah, we're good, man. All right, I want to say thank you to Lacey Shookman and Sajara Eubanks, who both came on and were great, terrific interviews. Uh, very uh, – very, uh, especially Shajara, very uh, potential um, stars in the making there for Invicta. Got to definitely keep an eye on her. And um, uh, good luck to Lacey Shookman, who uh, made the call out. Hopefully she gets those fights that she wants. And uh, thank you again for coming on. And next Sunday, Monday, I mean, on uh, the 39th episode of our podcast, we're going to have John McDessie. And uh, possible another guest. We're going to keep on the lid for now until we get that confirmed. Until otherwise, Fight Fans, again, we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, SportsOfAnarchy.com, and, of course, our uh, Facebook page. We're everywhere. We can't be denied. Chris Pagman, if you want to hit him up, it's at Chris Pauyuka. Pa Pauyuka. Pauyuka. Spell P-A-G-L-I-U-C-A. And if you want to hit me up, at Nick the Phantom. If you want to hit Jonas up, uh, you can't. So if you <laughs> so uh, hit us up on uh, the Facebook page. That's where you can easily hit us up. We're always on there, and uh, we love talking to interacting fans when we can. And we appreciate uh, the the fans that have joined up recently. Um, we're certainly seeing a lot more activity on our page. It's pretty dope, and we like it, and we appreciate it. And uh, you know, give us a listen and listen to our other podcasts, especially with the the, the interviews we've done thus far. We've had a lot of great guests on. And, uh, you know, just uh, give us a review, a rating, uh, whatever, you, uh, just a comment, anything, anything you want to hear from us, anything different you'd like us to try out. We're always uh, open to uh, suggestions from the fans, so we appreciate you guys. Uh, <clears throat> Chris, anything else you want to add? Uh, no, yeah. Um, I did wind up changing the Twitter to MMAD Podcast. That's where you can find us now instead of Sports of Anarchy. It's at MMAD Podcast. Uh, aside from that, we really appreciate you guys listening. Subscribe to the podcast. Give us a rating and review. Let us know what you want to hear. Any guests you want to come, have come on, we can try to get. So, um, yeah, thanks again for listening, guys. Appreciate everybody and anything. And Jonas, anything else you want to say? Uh, nothing different than what Chris and you have already said. You know, we really appreciate the fans. Uh, we really appreciate any feedback you guys can give us. Uh, we're doing this for you guys. Uh, we're trying to, you know, give it to you the way it needs to be given to you. So. Uh, keep us in your uh, thoughts and uh, continue your support and we're very grateful for it we appreciate you guys thanks again for listening and uh, look out for our next episode